I'm naturally not the loudest talker in the world also. Although, all right, I'm still talking. Yeah, a little more? Can you hear me now? Yeah? Um, so uh, before we start the meeting, I wanted to let everyone know that Chairman Barbas is at a family funeral out of state. Uh, and Mike Lyons and Eric Anderson also had prior commitments and they're not gonna be able to be here tonight. Um, but I also, because I'm in the position of chairing the meeting, wanted to take a minute to apologize um, for a few things. I wanted to apologize for the very deep sense of division and disconnection that has grown between the Board of Education and the members of the black community uh, in the last few weeks. And I wanted to say that I am, um, and many of us on the board are learning how to be elected officials. And there are parts of public service that I am just starting to understand. Um, I personally ran for the Board of Education because I wanted to work to give every single child in Norwalk the best possible chance and opportunity and education. And I thought of my service, my public service, as being focused on that work. Um, and I'm not trying to make this about my experience at all. Um, but over the past few days, I've been reaching out and having conversations. And I have realized that part of public service is about connecting our community and also about making sure that everyone feels represented and heard. And so I also want to apologize for not better understanding the amount of work and energy and heart that is needed to help repair relationships between the members of the black community and the Board of Education as an institution. Um, and to start to heal this disconnection and this sense of exclusion that I have been hearing. I also wanted to clarify uh, that there was not a boycott of the NAACP Freedom Fund event um, or the MLK Day citywide celebration. I personally would have loved to go to both and I look forward to going in the upcoming year. Um, several of us weren't able to attend, not because we didn't want to, but because we had other commitments in our schedules. I had a performance. Um, I had to teach the evening of the MLK event and other board members had family responsibilities or work responsibilities. Um, and so as somebody who's learning about how to be a public servant and how to be in public service, I didn't realize how meaningful our attendance at that event was to the community um, or that a public explanation of why we didn't go was important. But again, um, I personally look forward to attending the Freedom Fund event this year. I want to welcome members of the NAACP and people who are here to support the NAACP here this evening. I want to thank you. I want to commend the work that you do in the community, uh, the advocacy that you do, and the fundraising that you do for students. And I also wanted to take a second to talk about concrete actions. Um, I spoke with Mayor Milling, and he told me that he spoke to both Mr. Barbas and to Ms. Penn Williams, and that they both expressed to him that they would be willing to talk through the issues uh, with him. Um, Ms. Corbett has been very, very diligently working on a code of conduct for a Board of Ed members um, with the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. And I personally have been reaching out to try to start building some bridges of communication. Um, so I want you to know that we're listening, that we're committed to improving our partnerships and our relationships to best support our students in Norwalk. Um, because I genuinely believe that we do our best work when we work together. So having said that, I would like to call the meeting to order at 7.08. And the first item is the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And the next item on the agenda is the spotlight. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Tonight's spotlight is highlighting the Scholastic Art Award winners for 2019. The Norwalk Board of Education is proud to honor the Norwalk Public School High School students who are recognized as Connecticut Regional Scholastic Art Award winners. These talented students were acknowledged for their work across a multitude of mediums, including photography, drawing and illustration, sculpture and painting. Winners were celebrated at the Regional Celebration Award Ceremony in January at the University of Hartford, where their artwork was displayed. 
The 28th Annual Connecticut Regional Scholastic Art Awards is the largest juried student art exhibit, exhibition in the state. Students across America submitted nearly 350,000 original works this year in 29 different categories of art and writing. Through the awards, students receive opportunities for recognition, exhibition, publication, and scholarships. Norwalk High School senior Jacob Timchak received a Gold Key Award for his photography piece entitled Elena. A blue ribbon panel of judges will review Jacob's work in March with the possibility of having his artwork exhibited in New York City this summer. We wish Jacob luck. The Norwalk Board of Education recognizes these talented students whose work provides insight into everyday life, unique circumstances, people, and emotions. As a district with one of the highest rates for participation in the arts in Connecticut, we are proud to have had these students represent Norwalk Public Schools on a regional and national level. Congratulations to all Norwalk Public Schools Scholastic Art Award winners. <laughs> among, among those recognized, we would like to um, uh, personally congratulate uh, from Brian McMahon High School, Olive Fengel. Olive is a, a grade 12 Silver Key Award in honorable a mention in sculpture and painting. Thank you, Olive. Could, would you please thank Olive? Up for recognition is Jacob Timchak from Norwalk High School, 12th grade, Gold Key Award in Photography. Please come up here. Next up, we have Felicity uh, Laga, I'm sorry, Laga Marizno, grade 12, honorable mention in drawing and illustration. Three more. If you're here, please uh, wave your hand and come up. But uh, uh, Hannah Coleman, uh, 12th grade, Silver Key Award in Drawing and Illustration. Congratulations, Hannah. Uh, Also from Norwalk High, Grace Long, 12th grade, Silver Key Award in Drawing and Illustration. from Norokai, Natalie Hernandez, 11th grade, honorable mention in photography. 
Congratulations. And lastly, I would just like to uh, recognize uh, Principal Scott Hurwitz from Brian McMahon for his effort and support. And also uh, Patty, I'm sorry, Patty, I don't know if your last name, Director of Art Department from Norwalk High School. And that ends the spot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Meek, and thank you and congratulations to everyone uh, who was just honored at Spotlight. And the next item on the agenda is public comment, and I would ask that we have several people signed up this evening so that if you would try to keep your comments to three minutes, that would be genuinely appreciated so that everyone has a chance to speak and be heard. Um, and the first person on our list is Mary Jordan. And make sure to state your name and address for the record. Mary Jordan, President of the Norwalk Federation of Teachers, 9 Mott Avenue. This is a statement that was adopted, approved unanimously by the general membership meeting today. The vision of the NAACP is to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights without discrimination based on race. The local organization sponsors scholarships for our students and brings speakers discussion and attention to important issues. NAACP members are not always right and they are not always wrong, but they are always trying to address real problems. Mr. Barbas's recommendation to encourage others not to attend the 2018 NAACP gala put his personal agenda ahead of the needs of the people of Norwalk especially the ethnically diverse students that attend our schools each day. His advice contributes to the long-standing racial insensitivity that exists within our community and the country that so many have worked tirelessly to overcome. A Board of Education in a diverse community such, of, such as ours should instead seek to take advantage of opportunities for greater understanding and to support community members in an effort to serve all of our students and families of Norwalk. His advice also demonstrates the tendency of this administration to limit input of those who disagree with them and to cut off and inhibit views that differ. This tendency has contributed to the current challenges resulting from poor implementation of several good ideas, such as those of middle school redesign and the next gen science standards. The teachers and school staff throughout the district have worked to implement these ideas and concepts despite the difficulties that have been created through an often rushed process <clears throat> and a process with limited or self-selected input. This administration will be remembered for many improvements while at the same time remembered for their steadfast refusal to work cooperatively with teaching professionals and accepting constructive criticism. This is a tendency that leads to groupthink, misinformation, misunderstandings, and missed opportunities to better understand and serve the members of our community, represented by the NAACP and others. Thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Brenda Penn Williams. Good evening. My name is Brenda Penn Williams. I reside at 21 Karen Drive, Norwalk. The Norwalk NAACP, whose mission includes upholding the civil rights of all Norwalk citizens in partnership with the Interdenominational Ministers Fellowship of Norwalk and Vicinity, does, does hereby request the resignation of Michael Barbas from the Norwalk Board of Education for the following reasons. Mr. Barber's letter dated October 5th, 2018 to fellow BOE members recommended that they do not attend the 2018 annual NAACP Freedom Fund Banquet 
This banquet is historically attended by district superintendents, BOE members, and central office administrators since the primary purpose of the event is to raise scholarship funds for the Norwalk Public School students, a district that is predominantly minority and racial composition. Another is to recognize recognize citizens and organizations who have contributed to promoting justice, equality, and celebrating diversity in our community. It is an important event that reminds us of the history and the price that was paid and continues to be paid to advance African Americans in a nation and city that has undeniably needed to overcome racial and economic bigotry and injustice. Chairman Barber's recommendation not to attend the annual banquet amounts to a boycott where he opposes the current NAACP leadership and the NAACP's position it has taken to address Norwalk Public Schools practices that are inconsistent with protecting the civil rights of all children, parents, employed staff, or BOE members who are of color. Essentially, Mr. Barbas recommended that a boycott against the NAACP leadership for standing up for everyone who fulfilled the NAACP mission. By nature of its existence, the NAACP watch, is a watchdog and conscious of our community. Furthermore, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Barbas marginalized the Norwalk branch NAACP by questioning whether it had a stored pass and saying it was tiny. As though size of the branch is more important than its message of the, of the constituency being represented. Thank you. Next we have <laughs> Reverend Jeffrey Ingram. Jeffrey A. Ingram, 6 Leatherwood Road. The second reason being advanced, requ requesting the resignation of Mr. Barbers, the lack of transparency and truth truthfulness by which Mr. Barbers engages in is very apparent whenever he chairs a committee. For example, when Mr. Barbers was asked by Nancy Chapman whether he asked or suggested BOE members not attend the NAACP banquet, he denied doing so. However, it became apparent only upon receipt of an FOIA request asking for a copy of the October 5th, 2018 email. This email showed that Mr. Barbers was not truthful. This Board of Education and our community should be appalled that Chairman Barbers would lie about such an important action and bring disgrace upon Noah Public Schools. His deceit clearly demonstrates a lack of integrity, poor character, and egregious failure at leadership. Another example is the NPS Facility Study Committee chaired by Mr. Barbers, where he held meetings without public notice from January through September 2016. The plan had serious implications for Latino and African American residents of South Norwalk and all city residents beyond that area. The final recommendations of that plan were disputed and consensus was not achieved by those affected the most. Full community participation did not take place during a process that appeared to have been a foregone conclusion and failed miserably in terms of transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Barbara Sumner Harris. Barbara Sumner Harris, 88 Taylor Avenue. Further concern for the African American community is the large number of African American administrators who appear to have been targeted by the current administration and this Board of Education. Upon Dr. Adamdowski's arrival, he systematically eliminated African-American administrators and programs. Bruce Morris, Human Resource Officer, 
The, pre the position was eliminated and he was terminated. Pamela Augustine Jefferson, Central Office Administrator over Early Childhood, was demoted to Curriculum Instructional Site Director, the equivalent of an assistant principal. Sarah Legister, Special Education Instructional Specialist at Central Office, demoted to teacher. Dr. Marie Allen, principal at Briggs, demoted to assistant principal, and Briggs has been closed. Dr. Lynn Moore, principal, demoted to assistant principal. Reginald Roberts being targeted. And all administrators that were moved or demoted have been replaced with Caucasians. Thank you. Next, we have Jim Clark. Hello, I'm Jim Clark, uh, 9 Golden Hill Street. Mr. Barbas, Mr. Lyons, and other current uh, BOE members denied allegations that they discriminated against or uh, isolated uh, female, black, and Latino board members who formerly served uh, Norwalk Public Schools. Uh, the Norwalk uh, NAACP, through its then Vice President, uh, Brenda Penn Williams, uh, brought discrimination complaints uh, to the Board of Education members and her claims of discrimination on behalf of the minority uh, BOE members were consistent with the NAACP mission. Ms. Penn Williams and the NAACP were ridiculed and scorned uh, mostly by Mr. Lyons, but also by Mr. Barbas for more than a year. A general disregard for the Norwalk NAACP was evident. Yet documents from the Chrissy Fensor lawsuit revealed the claims to be true by the women of color who formerly served on the board. These board members were not included in, in several emails uh, by Mr. Lyons and were referred to in negative terms whenever advocating for issues important to people of color. So this makes the recent op-ed uh, signed by all but one current member of this board on February 12th, uh, 2019, appear to be disingenuous at best. The Fensor evidence shows how minority uh, board members were deliberately marginalized due to their difference in perspectives. As stated in the hour, board members were calling, quote, Norwalk Democratic and Republican parties to do a better job of finding diverse and competent candidates for the BOE to carry on this work, end quote. So given that minority BOE members have been marginalized in the past, why should anyone take seriously this appeal to recruit competent Democrat or Republican minorities to serve on the board? Is the BOE service only respected or deemed competent when one is compliant and in agreement with the racial majority on the board? How can this current board that has no minority members assure us they would not discriminate against minority members, particularly in light of Mr. Barbas' email? Diversity means, some people say it means different. So we are asking this board as a whole, who through no, no fault of your own uh, do not represent the diversity of, of Norwalk, but please commit to do whatever you can to endorse and enforce sensitivity and celebration of diversity and valuing civil rights. Your commitment can be first demonstrated by joining our plea for the resignation of Mr. Barbas, who has undeniably lied and demonstrated animus and he's demonstrated animus towards people of color and institutions that protect people of color. Further, a renewed commitment on your part is needed to safeguard and implement programs that specifically benefit socioeconomically disadvantaged children and also needed per your affirmative action plan is a renewed commitment to implement measures that retain and promote our qualified minority staff. Thank you for listening. Thank you. 
Next, we have Diane Loricella, or Loricella. I'm sorry, I don't know which it is. Loricella. Lauricella. Lauricella. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, th my name is Diane Loricella, 21 Blue Mountain Ridge Road in Norwalk. My comments have to do with unfinished business and an opportunity to heal. There are many policies for children's behavior when they encounter disagreements. There has been a lot of time and effort by this board and previous boards to make sure that people behave in civ and, and use civility when they have disagreements. Many of our schools have these kinds of mottos in their main entrance. We come here tonight, and I, I'm not speaking on behalf of NAACP, but I am a member. And I've done a lot of work with people that have joined NAACP. I found that what comes down to a good old-fashioned shunning email, which was just discovered by some of us recently, is so heartbreaking. It's a form of bullying. Do you know that bullying is not just people that yell at you? Another form of bullying is to isolate and shun, to be intolerant. Some of this began at a time when we did have some people of color on the board. We had so many opportunities at that time because there, was obvious prob there were obvious problems. Why didn't we seek wise counsel and training then? Unfortunately, what happened and what does happen when shunning is created? You have heartbreak, missed opportunities to excel, to heal, missed savings for our taxpayers, reduced success of our students. In order for citizens to feel interested in running, which some have mentioned on this board, they must feel welcome and that they can offer different opinions without the fear of retaliation. That's your time. I myself am currently doing research on an encounter I had with Mr. Barbas that some of you have read about, but I didn't want to take away from the important message that we're talking about tonight having to do with the way NAACP was treated. Now on both sides, there is a need to train and counsel. This is an opportunity to heal and to that end, I propose that the Board of Ed, with the help of the staff, because it is their job to do so, immediately puts together a, a series of diversity trainings for the Board of Directors and any appropriate staff to make sure that this going forward no longer happens and make sure that every incoming Board of Ed member has this training so that we no longer have the shunning, the feeling of isolation, because it is so important that we move forward in a positive way for P all of the diversity of Norwalk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Lisa Henderson, and I would like to ask, I understand completely wanting to applaud the speaker, but you're cutting into their time if you don't hold your applause to the end of their remarks. Good evening. I'm Lisa Henderson from Apple Tree Lane in Norwalk. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the hard work of the Board of Education members and the Norwalk Public Schools Administration and staff over the past five years. We've come a long way since my children graduated five years ago, and we still have a long way to go. Many of us have come out over the years and supported the budgets and the standard operating um, the standard operating uh, um, strategic, <laughs> strategic operating, strategic plan. operating <laughs> plan, thank you, Barb, mm -hmm. um, over the years. Is it perfect? No, nothing is. Um, especially, it's never going to be perfect um, if we continue to have this division in our community. Um, it's time for everyone in this room and in our community to continue to work together for all the children in Norwalk. Uh, I'm not hearing a lot of um, talk about the children in Norwalk tonight and the strides that they have made in our community. Um, also, tonight, I'm here with my daughter, 
who's observing this meeting for her master's program in public policy and administration. Yeah. Is this a good segue um, for her future in public service? I hope she gets to see a community now that figures out how to come together. Mm -hmm. I do thank all of you. I thank Norwalk Public Schools administration and staff because we really have come a long way. And my children are proof of that. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have uh, Joe Genderko. Are you here, Joe? Joseph Genderko, Nine Mile Avenue. As you are aware, I have spoken at nearly every Board of Ed meeting for the past several years, offering praise when deserved, offering constructive criticism when required, and offering suggested opportunities to rebuild the relationship between the teachers in Norwalk, the administration, and the BOE. I'd like to take a moment to point out and thank Dr. Kimmel for his invitation to participate in the curriculum committee meetings. We just had one this evening. Dr. Myers and her staff um, for the recent inclusion of the NFT and many teachers in some of the new initiatives. The NFT is hopeful and encouraged by this recent trend and believe it should continue. However, many other requests, suggestions, and input have been largely ignored. The administration, in conjunction with some members of this Board of Ed, have worked to silence any voice of criticism or differing viewpoints. For example, limiting the parental input for high school start times is just one recent example. Ignoring the facts that have been repeatedly suggested at two focus groups only proves that decisions are made regardless of what the community wants. This one decision impacts all schools, all children, and all staff members, <coughs> yet little to no involvement was given to middle and elementary school families. Many community members have commented about the poorly constructed survey and the need for a new one. However, this simple suggestion was ignored and the proper information has largely been uncollected. In recent days, we have seen this desire to silence the voices taken to a whole new level. Rude and disrespectful behavior continue to be the norm for some of this elected board. If this is to continue, the positive strides that we have made will be overshadowed by this horrible stain of negative behavior. History will record the legacy of this administration in the BOE as one that has worked to diminish the voices of teachers and the voices of the minority community. Don't allow this to happen. Take a moment to reflect and actively reach out to all stakeholders to rebuild and repair the relationship that will allow a better and brighter Norwalk to be built. Thank you. Um, if there's anyone else, there's no one else on the list. If there's anyone else who would like to offer a public comment, uh, now is the time. Okay. In that case, we will move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have two, uh, two items in my report tonight. Um, the first uh, is the uh, appointment of the School Counseling Redesign Committee. Uh, I want to just uh, uh, recall for the board's uh, benefit that um, this summer, um, when we discussed at your board retreat, the priority implementation steps for the 18-19 uh, school year. Uh, one of those, number 21, uh, was the study and redesign of K-12 guidance services, including responsibilities of guidance and college counselors and counselor-student staffing ratios consistent with current research, evidence-based practice, and secondary school redesign, and the need to promote social-emotional learning and student executive uh, functioning. And I think there was some work reworking with this from Ms. Mayor Mitchell and, um, and others. Um, the, this was um, adopted by the board in September as one of your goals uh, for the year. So I'm pleased to report that we are uh, at the point of initiating uh, this study. And I would uh, just share with you uh, the committee's charge and a uh, roster of those who have uh, agreed to serve. Um, this charge is, uh, is, is 10 points, one of our, our longest charges uh, thus far <laughs> in any of our studies, uh, reflecting both the importance of this work 
as well as the amount of work I think that needs to be done and the broad interest that uh, parents and other stakeholders have in, um, in this role in our, our school system. So I'll just review this with you uh, briefly. Uh, the first is to review and benchmark the current roles and responsibilities of school counselors, where we perceive there is a great deal of variety, um, uh, perhaps from, from person to, to person. Second is to review the best practices that have been established by the American School Counseling Association, national and state regional programs, the Hanover Report on School uh, Counseling Practices. Very similar to the um, gifted study a year ago, uh, we have uh, commissioned a, a Hanover review of the research on uh, best practices, which will be available for review by the uh, committee. Uh, conduct focus groups and surveys of stakeholders regarding satisfaction with current counseling service and the desired type and level of, uh, of service. Uh, differentiate roles and responsibilities associated with effective counseling programs, focusing on transitions, college and career counseling, and consideration for areas of uh, specialization. Um, Number five, specify and sequence the responsibilities for college counseling and college going tasks and activities for students at each uh, level, grades nine through 12, to include pre-college experience and visits, financial planning, and scholarship opportunities. Six, define the role of counselors in relation to the capstone requirement for graduation to include career internships. Seven, develop a plan for implementation of public act number 17, uh, dash 42 section C, D, uh, G, and J to provide personalized success plans. This was part of the um, Connecticut Omnibus Reform Legislation of 2012 that calls for an individual success plan for each student. And it's also geared toward the, the four, fifth, and, and six year graduation rate. We have not been following uh, this uh, currently. Uh, we, we have never followed it uh, since the passage of the, uh, of the law. Number eight, examine the Connecticut Comprehensive School Counseling Framework Model for implementation of social-emotional curriculum in middle schools with emphasis on coping skills and strategies, executive order and study skills, and developmental counseling programs. Uh, develop an implementation plan for grades six through eight. Nine, recommend counselor to student ratios at each level based upon regional, state, and national, national norms and accreditation requirements. And finally, number 10, develop a comprehensive multi-year plan for professional development, including a systemic plan for recruitment and retention of highly qualified counselors, provision of clinical supervision and coaching of school counselors necessary to implement the redesign recommendations. The um, um, members who have agreed to serve are on the attached uh, roster. Um, we have uh, a number of um, counselors, uh, administrators who have counseling backgrounds, um, community members, uh, and I'm very pleased to say students from both uh, high schools. And we think this will be in Ms. Um, um, Ms. Corbett has agreed to serve as a board liaison. So the first uh, meeting, the orientation meeting of this group will launch on Wednesday, February 27th uh, from 3 uh, to 5 p.m. in room 330 here at City Hall. And I'm sure Ms. Corbett will be providing you with periodic uh, updates of the committee's work. And we look forward to this study on a very important uh, issue. Uh, affecting virtually all of our, uh, of our students. The uh, second item on my report, I'm going to ask Dr. Meyers to um, uh, come up. Um, the um, high school program of study for 1920 is on your agenda tonight for approval. You'll recall that last year, after uh, 20 years of virtually no revision, there was a major revision of the high school program of study as we started down the path to a 26 credit graduation requirement organized into pathways to graduation. And uh, this year we have further revisions as all of our students will now be involved in the 26 
credit graduation requirement. You remember your first revision involved only uh, grades 9 and, uh, and 10. Um, we anticipate bringing this to you um, in certainly uh, less, more frequency than every 20 years, but it will come to you, it will come to you again whenever there is another major uh, revision. Uh, the revisions that uh, Dr. Meyer will summarize tonight um, have been reviewed in detail by the uh, Curriculum Instruction Committee. Uh, but for the benefit of the uh, rest of the board and members of the public, uh, she's going to provide some of the high points that are going to be defining our high school program going forward. Good evening, board members, Dr. Adamowski, community members, and colleagues. I'm very honored to be here this evening. I'm very proud of the program of study we're presenting this evening. I'd be remiss if I didn't please uh, start by thanking my colleague, Adam Reynolds, uh, the work that he did last year and really kind of taking us uh, 20 years forward in our program of study uh, needs to be recognized. And what we did is kind of lifted from that moment to say now what else do we need to do? How else can we clarify specifically the work in pathways and specifically the commitment that the board has made to ensuring every student having 26 credits and a comprehensive high school program that represents a range of choice. I also want to give a special thank you to our high school principals. This document and the cover that you see here that's been put together um, by the students uh, from the Norwalk Public Schools uh, represents the distinguishing four high schools that will make up Norwalk Public Schools starting uh, for the 2019 school year. And you can notice in our, our opening that we have representation for McMahon, P Tech. Norwalk High School and the Center for Global Studies. Um, our principals have been key in making sure that this document reflects what we call is the public school promise, right? What we put in here is what our students have available to them and part of our commitment as we move through all kinds of decision making, scheduling, staffing, budgeting, so that we can put this promise together. So our principal is Scott Horowitz, Karen Armaker, Reginald Roberts, and Julia Parham. If I could just take a moment and give a round of applause for the hard work our principal <laughs> You'll notice a couple of changes in the document, and mostly these are clarifications to the work that we do. I did put together for the Board of Education uh, what we would call a, a little summary sheet because it is a, a large document. We've gone through and reformatted, and we've built out some visual representations to kind of clearly show the pathways. But I did give you a guideline that as you look at the key changes in the document, and that's really the pieces that we're approving tonight, and the page reference specifically has been attached for you, so you have a little bit of a, a cliff notes for the program of study. Um, we did lay out in there our alternative education de uh, description. In that description, we have our core lab and our iLab program. Specifically, we've listed also the credit recovery options. So when a student has completed a course that they need for graduation, but they were not able to successfully complete it, so they have a failing grade, but they did participate in the course, there's an opportunity for credit recovery where they can work in an online program to actually remake the modules of the curriculum that they're missing so that we can help to maintain students on credit and ready to graduate. We do offer a few online opportunities also where students can supplement their transcript with some online courses and specifically to help students who may be behind or trying to access a, a specific curriculum that they can't get into their schedule. So we now have listed those so we have clear guidance uh, for all of our programming. Some of the new courses that we're offering, again, linked to Pathways, building out each one of our programs. You'll see a description in there for our new course in Latin American Studies. You'll see a new course description for a high school course in Design Art 1 and Design Art 2, <coughs> which is a two-year sequence. Computer Repair and IT course has now been divided into four courses, a half year each, ending in a fourth year internship. Part of this design is also that a student may want to pick up one part of the computer IT 
repair. And some students want to take the entire sequence and, and be able to participate in the internship. So having the quarters give us the immense flexibility for students to be able to participate in the program. You know, we're continuing to build out our IB sequence, and so our newest IB offering for next year will be sports, exercise, and health science. We also have a new science offering in public health and epidemiology. And you'll see our sequence for our new marine science program and the description of our new marine science academy. So uh, next year we'll be offering marine science one. We've tried to lay out in this document because this is a resource for parents and for students and it's a document that we use with guidance <coughs> and it helps us to kind of look at what all of the offerings are for high school. And so we have updated the course planning guides which include this kind of transcript to the 26 credits, where you need those transcripted credits, how you might achieve them, and actually it creates a record that you can use over time to see progress towards the 26. One of the things we've had is quite a few conversations where our guidance counselors have worked extensively looking at where our ninth graders, 10th graders, and 11th graders are on their trajectory towards graduation. So you know, just about the time you finish the program of study, and we did have a pretty aggressive timeline because we knew when scheduling would start, we knew when uh, school-based budgeting would be put in place, we wanted to make sure we were very clear about the course offerings. So we're always in development, and uh, we have a, a team working on our IB implementation and looking at the course sequence over time and some of the transition between IB and AP and what those offerings will look like. Again, so that students entering ninth grade have a very clear picture of the opportunities. We're building out our marine science program, so next year will be the first year and we'll be developing more courses in that sequence. We have a world language task force meeting and the task force has been looking aggressively at the 6 through 12 world language program. I know the board raised some questions last year about the languages that we're offering and we really looked at what are the offerings that we needed to include, how would we make those decisions, are there any gaps in our offering. We have two issues that we really need to face. We're making a recommendation that would be in the next program of study to begin offering American Sign Language as a new language at Norwalk, uh, for Norwalk Public Schools. We have a kind of a gap in that area and as we build out the opportunity for three years in a world language, this would give us a more full world language program. The second thing we're looking at is we need to address our middle school world language program because currently it sits as an elective in world language and is not part of the core. But if students take world language and are successful in middle school, they could earn one credit, which would carry them into the high school. So remember <coughs> in the um, policy that the board has in front of them this evening, there are two opportunities for middle school students to earn credit towards that 26 at high school, one in mathematics and one in world language. We want to make sure that every student in the middle school has that opportunity. Right now, not all students are taking um, the world language sequence over 6th, 7th, and 8th grade and are not eligible for that credit. So we have to really dig into that issue with the task forces working on it. We're going to continue to look at what the world language offerings are and we're going to build out a proposal for you to bring the sign language in. Um, also, the Center for Global Studies is working with Giselle martin Keneath, and they are looking at course design and looking at cross-cutting themes around civic engagement as they're building out some more of the course changes at the Center for Global Studies. So I think you might see some new course descriptions as we move forward to the, believe it or not, the 2021, right? It'll be here before you know. So, so if you look at the overall document, it continues to look at the pathways continues to build that strong vision and promise that we have for all of Norwalk Public Schools, uh, made some changes in formatting, hopefully have aligned the, the programs the way it'll be helpful for people to see, and uh, makes an incredible promise to the students at Norwalk Public Schools. Uh, I do have to say a very special thank you, hundreds of hours of work, Ed Singleton, Barbara Woods, Don Leeds, and Dan Sullivan. Uh, just my guide by the side, 
making sure that course codes, how is it scheduled, what will it look like on a transcript. We asked 100 questions to make sure that this document fulfills its <coughs> promise and to the Board of Education. Your commitment to 26 credits makes the offerings in this program of study possible and we continue to look at making sure that every one of those offerings is as rich as possible. Any questions? Thank you. One question, though, about the American Sign Language. Can you go into a little bit more detail? I think it's fabulous that we'll actually be offering that here for the first time. So if you can just kind of walk us through what that will look like for some of our students. Yeah, so American Sign Language is a recognized world language. It has a certification, so we would need a certified teacher to be able to teach that. It has a three-course credit, so it could parallel something like um, French or a Spanish, so we still have a sequence to that. The other thing that's nice about it is that it's also a course we offer right now, we do have some students will pick up maybe a year of Latin, right, mm -hmm. as a kind of a fourth uh, a year of a world language. And we'll have students who will take, um, maybe have a language sequence, but then pick up American Sign Language as a particular, maybe a one-year course. So it gives some flexibility in that richness as well. And specifically what we're seeing is we're always worried about our, our college and career readiness, and we're looking at students who are going to go into multiple fields where the, having the ability to sign will be very important to their, to their work um, in the future. It also appears to be a language. Sometimes there are children who have some linguistic difficulties. Mm -hmm. And all of our languages are so linguistically based. We find that they're very successful with sign language. Mm -hmm. So now we're also differentiating our program to make sure we can meet that three credit requirement for all children. Okay. Anyway. Thank you. Um, I had a few quick question. Um, this is so exciting and I, I can't even imagine if this kind of course catalog was offered at my high school, the fun I would have had choosing. So thank you for putting this together. Thank you for, t for to the full team. I do want to just quickly ask a question because I'm ignorant. With the credit recovery, there's an online component, but there's a teacher who's guiding the student. Can you yes. speak to that process for a moment? So we use the Edgenuity platform <clears throat> for credit recovery because it has adopted courses and it has sequence and modules. And then the teacher who's assigned can select the modules specific to a student to help them complete their course recovery. So we do have a teacher who's also there. We have a teacher looking at the student performance. And then we have the curriculum that we draw from. So what happens in the Edgenuity is they might have 20 modules and we pick the eight the student needs for, in order for them to say they have met the course. Before we had credit recovery, how did we handle those situations? How long have we been using what we call now credit recovery? Ralph, um, how long do we have had ingenuity? <laughs> so, so the ingenuity system, this is the uh, third year or second year, Ralph? Um, this is the third year. Uh, we had it for two years at uh, NTA. So just to um, you know, kind of highlight where we've come on this, yeah. Uh, we had a, a credit recovery uh, summer program for students that were one or two courses from graduation. However, um, um, that th this was in existence when I became superintendent. However, the district charged for it, and so <coughs> the you know the, the students of lowest income couldn't participate. And quite often, we would lose students who were you know one or two credits away from graduation. Um, so our first step, um, which would, would have been uh, three years ago, uh, was to open that without charge as part of our regular summer learning program. That was also the, the time when we started to extend the summer school program from K-3 to 4, and as you know, we're up to sixth grade uh, now. So um, that, is, um, that is our uh, credit recovery program uh, for the summer. However, um, the, what, what Brenda is really referring to here is what happens on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. if a student fails a, a, a course. So in the old days, you had to wait, right? Or you had to take the whole course over, even though you might be, you know, you might have failed because you didn't understand or fully comprehend one module or, or you were out for a period of time and you missed three 
three modules that you need to, um, to make up. So this is a much better, better system. Um, the students who would uh, drop out of school in our, in our prior experience would drop out between ninth and 10th because they would be in a large high school. They would wander around belonging to no one and they would um, fail, their, fail their courses and then give up. So now there's no giving up. Uh, the minute you, first of all, we have the, the uh, structural tier two supports in place, read 180, math 180, and um, <clears throat> systems 44, that is, you go into it at, at uh, the onset as a counseling decision. And then, you know, if you were to fail a course along um, the line, you make it up uh, immediately. This has a lot to do with the student success plans that we're going to be studying uh, relative to the guidance study mm -hmm. because the two variables here are support and time, right? So if everyone's going to reach uh, a college-ready standard, we have to vary time and we have to vary uh, support. Yeah, the, the, you know, we've talked a lot over the last couple of years about uh, several years ago at the elementary and middle school level, we really didn't have any tier two remediational remediation programs. We didn't have the interventions that we needed and kids were just falling by the wayside. And uh, we've corrected that and we've closed the achievement gap substantially since then. Uh, we, this is the first time we've really gotten into how we handle similar situations in high schools where, because I can understand how uh, a young a ninth or 10th grader, anything can happen and pretty soon the kid is out of school for a period or something happens and the kid is back in school and the kid is overwhelmed, the student is overwhelmed. And we didn't have, I didn't know what we had in place to handle. Those kinds of situations or the kinds of situations that Dr. Adamowski just talked about. So I'm, I, it's interesting to see how this works. Uh, it's like getting a note home, okay? <laughs> but every couple of weeks to keep you from falling that far behind. One last point related to this, and I know it's not part of the program for uh, study, but it keeps coming up and it has to do with study halls. And it's related to credit recovery in that it's a kind of remedial uh, structure that we have in the high schools. Uh, it, it's not a study hall, I forget what we call it, but it is guided and it is to ensure that a student doesn't really fall behind in a course. Could you explain that a little bit? So we, we do have some targeted instructional modules where a student might be assigned for some specific support. And one of the places we would use that is with our ELL students as well, so that they're getting some ELL support as well as working on their academic support. So it's, it's very specific and targeted. The difference it is non-credit bearing. So we really minimize those because those are support periods. Those are not credit periods. And they are definitely not study halls. And they are not study halls. Now, so, you know, we'd like to be able to expand this from, um, I think as, as Dr. Maris points out, the majority of cases, these are either English language learners or students with special needs. Again, this is a support. We want to vary time. We want to vary support. If you look at the 26 credit requirement, we have an eight period day, right? So you really uh, can get through this if, if you're a student by taking six or seven courses, particularly if you need support in a particular uh, area. Unlike the study halls, these are staffed by teachers who are providing assistance to, to children. So again, time is a variable. Some children need more time to master something. Others need more support to master something. So this is something that we're hoping to expand beyond the high needs, um, you know, groups of, of students that we're serving currently that way. Madam Heidi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, if I could just digress just for a minute, Dr. Adamowski, you're talking about the committee charge for the School Counseling Redesign Committee. I think it's excellent. I think Julie is a great point person on this as our liaison. So I wanted to say that I think this is well needed and I'm glad that we have actually a committee that will be working on that. Um, Dr. Myers, in regards to this, as a board, we know all about um, the IB program, Brian McMahon, the Medical Healthway, Healthcare Academy, Marine Science, Digital Media and Communications uh, at Newark High School, um, P-TECH. Can you just go into a little detail? We know as a board, but I think many members of the audience might not be as familiar with some of our pathways, some of our really fantastic programs that we're offering at our high schools. Can you just briefly go through even the digital media program that we have? P-TECH, which is huge, which we have quite a few students in now. 
So I'm going to tell you, remember, I'm the one that's like been here for six months, right? So I've been learning your yeah. programs <laughs> as fast as I could as well. Um, and so each one of our programs, so if we take a look at our P-TECH program, right, which really looking at building out that relationship, it's a unique program yeah. because we're making the connection between high school and community college, right? We're articulating out the 16 years, and we're helping students to be supportive not only with a high school diploma but to an associate's degree. Right? So the courses are built out in collaboration with our community college. Um, when you look at some of the other pathways, I think one of the unique pieces you'll see is that they build off partnerships, right? right? So the Marine Studies program, there's a particular interest by the student, there's rigorous curricular requirements, they meet the 26 graduation credits, and there's a partnership, there's a real life experience built into that. And right now we're working, obviously, with the uh, aquarium so that we have a good partnership there in our digital uh, program. We're certainly working with the TV studio, right, our new kind of media environment. So I, as opposed to going through each one of the pathways no, specifically, perfect. you can yeah. see kind of the way it has to have a ticky in each box right. to kind of create that pathway and to make sure that we have rigor and relevance, which is the framework that we've been kind of designing. Thank you. No, that's perfect. I think my point, I'm glad that you mentioned this, just for community members that are out there, you have this handout, but just to get more of a clearer Thank idea. You. And I will emphasize the great things that we have going on in our public schools, especially in our high schools, and choices that we have for our students coming in is really quite important and really remarkable, I think. Absolutely. And it, you know, it makes us raise the question as we look at our middle schools, right, too. So yep. we're, we're creating environments for students to be prepared for this range of pathway. And it, it, it kind of sets that vision all the way from kindergarten, right? Mm -hmm. well, I think it sets the tone from elementary school, and then you're in middle school, and then we have our redesign. And then in middle school, you're thinking it's seventh grade. Okay, well, am I going to go to Norwalk High School? Am I going to go to Brian McGrain? What type of study? What am I interested in? So I think it gets our children, our students, really thinking about it could be a career path, it could be a college path, whatever they're looking for, but I think the wheels are turning at that point. So instead of waiting until our students hit ninth grade and thinking, okay, what am I gonna do? They could start thinking about that in our middle schools, and I'm sure our middle school teachers are also talking about this. So getting our children ready and prepared as they lead on to high school. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, and the Mayor mentioned this earlier, um, I think that one of the most important new emerging middle school issues now in light of the fact that we have for the first time a three-year language requirement at the high school <clears throat> is going to be making languages at the middle school a part of the core uh, as opposed to uh, in elective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, if we can do this in a way that's part of the core, a student can earn one language credit by the time they're uh, leaving eighth grade. And then they would, if they have, if they're in a different pathway, they would be able to take two more language classes in high school. For students that were in a language pathway in any of the languages that we're offering, including Japanese, Chinese, and Arabic, um, those uh, students could take then five years of a of, of a language. So, which is what the experts tell us, you need to take in order to get to a level of proficiency where you can think write and read in the, in, in the language. So um, again, you know, we're, I think we're able to work on these issues because we've solved some of the um, kind of fundamental core issues that we were grappling with. And now, you know, the exciting work is, is that we can, uh, we can go further and, and evolve further in terms of uh, quality. I just wanted to share something that I thought was really fascinating that the Wilton Board of Education is working on a proven. I don't know if you read about it, but they have actually developed a half credit executive function for college course, really? which we should perhaps look yeah, to look. learn from. It could um, enable perhaps students who don't have that um, instruction in their home environment people with 504s, people with IEPs who will need to advocate for themselves and manage their time well once they move beyond high school. I think that would be a great one to consider. And they also added a really fascinating um, analytics leading up to engineering class that we might want to take a look at. So learning from the best practices of our successful neighbors, it would be great Absolutely. as we, that, that's, it's all so good, Absolutely. just more. <laughs> just to close, you'll notice that the picture here is a, a beautiful array of sunflowers. And <laughs> that metaphor is not lost on the program of study. So in and of itself, it is just a document. 
but it's the commitment of your administrative team, your faculty, and your staff that every day we're kind of planting that flower, and watering it, and tending it, and, and we know that it'll, it'll land a lot more seeds, right? And we'll continue. Right now you see an array of, of sunflowers, and next year you'll see even more, right, if we're mm -hmm. successful. Thanks, Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just, uh, just two, more, uh, two more thank yous, if I could. I, I did want to thank our department heads, our high school department heads, all of whom have been involved uh, in this, um, in this uh, process. Ms. O'Connor's here tonight, but all, all of our department heads have. And, and Dr. Mayer for leading this, uh, this effort and providing so much involvement for our staff that their work on this program of study uh, would also provide a growth opportunity for, for them. So thank you. Okay, so now we will move on to actions. And the first item is the consent calendar. Um, can motion I have a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? That motion passes unanimously. Uh, next is approval of personnel. Uh, uh, that's. No, I'm sorry. That's, oh, that's all. That's all. Consent. That's all part of it. Number okay. three. Number high school three. program. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, approval of the high school program of studies. Can we move the item? A second. Any discussion? We're, we're good. All in favor? Okay. Unanimous. Um, we have approval of naming of the learning commons at Brian McMahon High School. May I have a motion? Motion. Ms. Corbett. A second. second. Dr. Kimmel. Any discussion? Quick, quick question. Uh, Suzanne, Suzanne's okay with us, right? <laughs> 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 awesome. Thanks, Scott. So, so you have a policy on this, um, and uh, uh, it requires the endorsement or request from the SGC. Um, Scott, I'm wondering if you or Frank can just review that briefly with the board so you're aware that uh, we're following uh, the, your, your policy. Sure. Uh, not, uh, oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. It's at the bottom of the pile. <laughs> I had no idea what that was for. So this applies to, there's, there's two requests to have uh, things named at Brian McMahon High School. One is the Learning Commons for Suzanne Brown Korshetz. The other one is the Press Box at the football field for George Albano. Um, both of them were presented to the School Governance Council, uh, I think, on our October meeting, and both were approved unanimously. So um, that, that's what I, we uh, decided. Like, you know, they, they weighed in and felt that it was appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. Dr. Kimmel, go ahead. Oh, thanks. So, you go ahead. <laughs> we're, we're sitting here with a bunch of reporters around us and everything. This is supposed to be a surprise. I know. <laughs> okay. Reporters, you understand so that? <laughs> okay. I, I, you know, I, I, I know it was a little bit. I get you know, it. Okay. It has to be official. It's plausible for it to truly be a surprise, but okay. you know, to the extent possible. <laughs> You'll keep it a surprise until it's not a Madam surprise Chair. anymore. Madam uh, Chair. Yes. I just want to comment that as I became involved in the Newark Public Schools and speaking to the community members, teachers, parents, and I was saying, who are the experts? Who should I talk to about best practices? Where are things going well? in Norwalk, everybody said, you have to talk to Suzanne Korshet. <laughs> so I think honoring her in this way um, and the remarkable achievements that she uh, has made and the investments in time and sweat and blood and tears into her building to make it the hugely successful school that you've inherited and are now taking the baton even further down the field um, is, is a perfect thing for us to do. So thank you for bringing that forward. Great idea. So we are in discussion. We've had a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. That passes. Um, and now we have item six, approval of the adoption of the student code of conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, number uh, Sure, I'm sorry. Uh, we're. Go, uh, number five. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We have to do that too. Approval of the naming of the football field press box at Brian McMahon High School. May I have a motion, please? I'll move it. Okay. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Now we are 
going to item six, which is the approval of the adoption of the student code of conduct, which was discussed at the last board workshop meeting. Um, I'm going to have a motion, Dr. Kimmel, and a second, Ms. Meyer Mitchell. And do we have any discussion about this item? Frank, could you come up on this for questions, please? And um, the board is aware this was the subject of your last uh, workshop <coughs> uh, session. Good evening. Yes. Uh, so at our, our last board uh, meeting, we uh, had our high school administrators, a teacher, a school counselor, and two students present to you restorative practices um, as we've begun to implement this process and, and have begun to train. Um, so the code of conduct, you have all had a chance to read through and uh, we're, we have our fingers crossed that you'll approve uh, the draft and make it a final document so that we could, can continue to work on uh, restorative practices throughout the system. And I would just like to say that I hope that you can tell from the response at the last board meeting that many of us thought this was a hugely positive step forward, myself included. So thank you for your work on it. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Enthusiastically. <laughs> <laughs> Unanimous. Great. Thank you, Dr. Thank Costanzo. You. Dr. Okay, and now we have uh, item seven, approval of a first read revised draft of the graduation requirements GPA rank policy. I need a motion. I'll move it. Dr. Kimmel. And I'd like to ask a question. Okay, I need a second. I'll second it. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, Frank, I, I, I think I, I vaguely understand uh, what it means when you say pr approval of first read slash revised draft, but I think it would be helpful if you explained it. The, uh, what, the, what that exactly uh, means, so, approval of first read, revised draft. Sure. Um, so uh, just to uh, recall some of the, the process steps that got us to this point tonight, um, you might remember that at the start of the school year, uh, actually at the end of the last school year, um, we had the tension point with the first graduating NECA class um, and figuring out how to factor in uh, the top student in that NECA program. Uh, while sim simultaneously maintaining the tradition of a valedictorian at Norwalk High School. Um, one of, the, one of the, the real key issues at that time that we discovered was that um, uh, the NECA students were, and the college courses that they were taking as dual enrollment courses uh, at the local community college was getting um, weighted differently uh, than it is for, it had been for Norwalk High School students. Uh, and so that was the tension point. The, the silver lining uh, in this process after many weeks of a task force that met on a regular basis, uh, Dan Sullivan, Dawn Leeds really did a remarkably good job at bringing folks together, uh, running focus groups at, at both uh, communities in both, on both sides of town. Um, uh, we determined that there was still an underlying tension in how we looked at the uh, weighting of dual credit classes uh, within each institution, so to speak. And so at about the same time, uh, the steering committee that oversees NECA um, was meeting with the superintendent. I happened to be in that meeting. Uh, and they were advocating uh, for NECA to become its own school. And that uh, for NECA, in order for NECA to fulfill its full potential, it really needed to be its own separate uh, high school. Um, that has happened. The state has approved that. Um, and NECA will be referred to as PTAC, as you saw in the program of studies starting with the 1920 school year. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the uh, draft policy that you have before you tonight, which has been before you previously, now takes that new dimension to into consideration. NECA will be a part of this policy just for the remainder of this school year. Uh, then it will be grandfathered out, and we talked about the details of that in the policy at our last policy committee meeting. I think everyone here, with the exception of Brian Meek, either sits on the policy committee or was in attendance for the policy committee meeting where we reviewed the policy document. Um, and, uh, and that policy document includes the, the, the setting forth NECA needing to uh, create a task force, uh, name the team, uh, and that team will begin to develop its own graduation requirements policy uh, that it will present to the policy committee before the end of this school year so that it can be approved and adopted for the 2019 2020 school year. So the policy that you have before you tonight um, is and isn't a first read. 
is in the sense that this policy came before you a couple of months ago uh, when we did not have the added information that NECA would become its own school as uh, viewed by the state of Connecticut. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I want to uh, commend the policy committee. It was, this is really complicated. It was as a puzzle or nut that had to be cracked or whatever you want to call it. And uh, what, I, uh, what I like about it is, as you know, I've always emphasized the need to minimize stress at the same time maintain rigor. And I think you've struck a good balance here. Going forward, what was also discussed at the meeting, and I'm sure the board will revisit, re revisit it later in a few years, uh, the issue of seat time versus course content. Not all courses are as rigorous as they, as are equally rigorous, uh, although not all courses have the same timelines, but seat time is what we use, and I think we'll soon be looking at that as something that's antiquated, especially as we develop all kinds of partnerships and different programs. We're going to have to figure out a way, or the state will have to figure out a way, to bend on this issue. Or there'll be very little incentive for, for a number of students to take some of these rigorous courses. So we're, it's a problem we're going to have to solve in a couple of years. But I think the committee did an excellent job. This was really a tough, tough one to deal with. Thank you. There's really no question that, um, that we are going in an education direction where mastery learning really um, needs to be taken into consideration. Um, the state already prescribes it as an option uh, mm -hmm. in the statute for uh, earning college uh, course credit. Um, and with online learning and individualized uh, learning plan, <coughs> we need to be looking at it. Uh, more closely in the future, and this policy is a step in that direction. Okay, if there's no further discussion, uh, all in favor. That passes unanimously, and now I would actually like to motion for a five minute recess because I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, <laughs> so, second. Thank you. Aye. <laughs> Let's vote it down. Point of <laughs>
Yeah, we're ready to go. And you're, you're up next. I feel like he's doing so much. We should just come to him. Okay. Yes. Back on. Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order and we will move to information and reports. And the first item is the January 2019 monthly financial report. Tom is fresh from his meeting with the Planning Commission tonight. Uh, yes, so uh, the uh, financial report, you have the January financial report, end of January. We are 58% of the way through the fiscal year and 50% of the way through the school year. We've spent uh, approximately uh, a little over 47% of the budget year to date, uh, and we are on track uh, and expect to uh, uh, end the year uh, within budget. And of course, uh, you know, as you're aware, we also now have the objective of trying to generate uh, uh, $1.9 million of savings in the current year, so we are actively uh, working on that and identifying where we uh, believe we may be able to save money and uh, uh, we'll be coming back to you with more information on that later I'm sure uh, as we uh, progress through the budget uh, budget process uh, the uh, just a couple of highlights um, salaries and benefits are, are on budget and trending as expended uh, I know we've talked in the past about Substitutes, uh, substitutes. Uh, we spent about 35% of our total budget for substitutes at this point, and so we are uh, tracking uh, substantially below last year's level with substitutes. Um, in the uh, professional and technical services area, you'll see we're down 25% in total compared to last year, and that is a reflection of the savings that we are experiencing uh, in special education, so uh, professional and technical services, in this case is a 330 line item for other professional and technical services where year-to-date expenditures are at uh, uh, two million, two point four million dollars compared to three point three million dollars at the same time last year. Um, the um, property uh, uh, services account, a uh, couple of things going on there. One, uh, as you may recall, uh, for the approved budget this year, we had uh, recoded uh, outsourced custodial services uh, from the 500 series of accounts uh, to the 400 series of accounts because it is a, a property related service. And so the total expenditures uh, in property services are up considerably from last year, but the reason they're up is because of the fact that uh, we reclassified uh, those uh, custodial, outsourced custodial expenses. Um, the um, 500 series of accounts uh, is where you'll see that that's previously where the custodial services were uh, had been classified, so uh, those uh, costs are going uh, down, you'll also see reductions in the 562 and 563 account, uh, which are special education tuition accounts, and those are down by 9.4% and 7.6% respectively uh, compared, to, uh, compared to last year. In the supplies and materials account, the uh, 600 series account, uh, we're tracking uh, fairly close to last year at just over uh, $3 million. Uh, there's a number of uh, different uh, categories of expenses in there. Electricity is uh, year to date, we're at about uh, having expended about 46% of our electricity budget, but we are about 10% down compared to last year. Um, Oil is down uh, uh, fairly substantially compared to last year, but I believe there may be a timing issue there in terms of uh, when some bills uh, have uh, get paid. Uh, so we'll have to, you know, see where we end the year. But uh, every indication is that uh, we expect to be uh, on budget uh, or better in that account. Uh, also, in the consumable workbooks account, uh, you'll see. Uh, uh, we've spent about 42% of the budget, but it's substantially less than last year. Uh, and that's because last year, I believe, there were some additional expenses uh, built into the budget uh, for, uh, for workbooks. Um, 700 series of accounts are the equipment accounts. And 
again, nothing uh, particularly extraordinary to report there. We've uh, expended about 50% of the budget, and so we are expecting those accounts to also end the year uh, on budget. And that concludes my report. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, just one question, Tom. Thanks. Um, busing, <coughs> 9510, is that a, is that a difference in timing of um, invoicing or are we tracking lower? We are tracking a bit lower because we did make some, uh, the board made some adjustments, uh, budget adjustments to uh, the busing uh, this year. We remember we uh, eliminated the courtesy rides and I think we eliminated a couple of uh, buses overall. So there was some savings uh, in, uh, in busing. Um, the other thing to uh, point out on, on transportation is we do get a pretty substantial discount for prepaying a, most of the bill up front, uh, but we did that last year as well. So I believe the year-over-year -year variance uh, reflects uh, a few hundred thousand dollars of savings that we had uh, uh, built into the budget for this year. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Any here? Uh, and now we have committee and representative <coughs> reports. Thank you so much, Tom. And why don't we start uh, with Ms. Cordes. Sure. Uh, so I'll report uh, for policy since Ms. Keyes has um, had to leave. Uh, so uh, there are a couple pieces. There's one piece that has kind of, it's been a combination of curriculum and instruction as well as policy on looking at the field trip um, policies as well as the procedures. Um, and so next steps on that will be forthcoming, um, but that's been a combination between curriculum and instruction as well as policy, trying to figure out what the best way is to tackle to make sure that um, our field trips across Norwalk Public Schools are aligned to the curriculum, aligned to what's going on in the classrooms as well as are accessible to um, as many, the, all students um, essentially. Um, uh, upcoming pieces on uh, the policy committee, we've, we've done some work on looking at summer school. Um, food services has been back on the policy uh, committee for a little bit and uh, we needed to request some additional information about looking at uh, implementation on what's, what's going on since the new procedures were updated back last spring um, to, to really figure out um, what's going on in the schools trickling down um, so that we can address policy appropriately there and then the next biggest item coming on the policy agenda is to dig back into the CABE audit which um, so at our upcoming meeting I anticipate a very large binder of <laughs> many many policies to look through um, some of them are minor and just need to be updated um, others that of them are a little bit more significant so that will be forthcoming um, the uh, Special Education Ad Hoc Committee is meeting this Thursday, and we are going to talk about a number of things, but in particular, uh, supervisory assignments, professional development, um, parent workshops in collaboration with SPED partners. We're going to get an update on the complaint to the State Department of Education. We're going to talk about um, a couple of projects that are happening in the district, uh, an expanding uh, Project Search and NEST program. We're going to talk about plans for transitioning from some consultants, and then we will have uh, another discussion about ways to support siblings of students with special needs. Cool. Thank you. Uh, finance, uh, the last finance meeting was canceled due to the, um, to the school uh, vacation, and we will meet again on March 14th. There's a couple of, of key important dates. We're kind of done from our side until the council approves the cap, which will happen at the end of this month. Uh, there's a couple of spot meetings that council's having that uh, some of us may or, or may not attend to just support our budget. Uh, but other than that, um, we're, we're a little bit quiet until those other milestones from the city side um, come up. And um, will you come back for announcements this yep. way? Yep, okay. we'll come back this way. Oh. Uh, the curriculum committee met earlier this evening. An interesting discussion of mer merit scholarships, uh, how different towns are doing, how we're doing. Uh, we need to do a whole lot better. Uh, it's, we looked at it as a barometer, uh, measuring where we've been more than uh, where we are right now, because uh, we know we're improving. But it does, it's interesting, unlike SAT scores, the merit scholars, the, the, the process starts in middle school. And so the high, uh, going from 20 to 26 credits, uh, 
diversifying our high school curriculum, improving it is very, very important. But we have to begin to look at uh, some of the policies and practices in the upper elementary grades and in middle school to ensure that we have more and more, more uh, merit scholars going forward. Uh, we also had a discussion of middle school redesign. We're going to, we're, it's, in, it's ready to be tweaked a little bit so we can provide opportunities for more students to take electives. We uh, had an interesting discussion of the possibility of switching uh, the K-8 PONUS, the new school there, uh, from st a STEM model to a STEAM model. We, we had a nice discussion. It's what's happening across the country. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, we approved it but recommended it go to the facilities committee so that they have an opportunity to look into it. We don't believe there'll be any additional costs or design changes or major staff uh, changes or anything like that, but it should go th through facilities. We also uh, made a commitment to bring this to the attention of the Honus School Governance Council to ensure that they're aware of the changes that are going on. And finally, we're moving ahead with our expanded uh, summer offerings. We're including sixth grade, as you know. We decided, that even though when we looked at the test scores, the end of year and the beginning of year test scores uh, from last, last September and prior June, we, we came to the conclusion it was too early to tell whether the springboard model has had an appreciable impact. And we want to we want to keep them going for another year. This summer, they will focus on the grades, the upper grades, which they're more experienced in dealing with. So we expect uh, more improvement. Also, we do want to look at the attendance records of the kids who are in the springboard at the end of the year. Look at the attendance records of the kids who are in the springboard summer program versus our program, because we did feel that the parental involvement in the springboard program would have some carryover effect into the regular school year. And we won't know until we begin looking at the data at the end of the school year. So that's about it. Thank you. Um, so Norwalk Acts is currently um, in, in the process of, of a national search for a new executive director. They have a new um, chair of the board, Kathy DeCesare, and they will be holding their next convening on March 5th at 9 a.m. at Stepping Stones Museum. They are looking at who still isn't at the table that could make an impact here in Norwalk as we leverage partnerships. Um, the PTO Council did not meet, however, members of it did meet with the city to discuss the permitting process as well as some other legal issues. And that's basically that's all that's on my agenda. Do you have any announcements? And then we'll Personal announcements? Personal. Goodness gracious. Um, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> um, no, I will say something. I, 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 no, this is interesting because I was thinking about it. It's wor worth noting. Um, Ms. Meyer Mitchell emphasizes on, on a number of occasions the need for us to begin to look at executive functions and the ability for kids as they move up the educational ladder. And as I'm thinking about my experiences when I, uh, with the NCC students and when I get special accommodations and things like that, most of the time it has to do with those kinds of issues. Right. And, and handling a course, a college course, handling a lot of college courses. So it's probably something we really have to look at seriously. If, if we want our kids to succeed once they get to college, that's it. Once they get there, so they're not overwhelmed. So it's just, just an interesting I was thinking about this evening. Okay. Yeah, just two quick things. Uh, on a lighter <laughs> note, uh, I commend uh, Dr. Costanzo for nailing the snow day last week. Uh, <laughs> and, All and, right, that's hard to do. And good, good luck tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and on a more serious note, uh, just congratulate and uh, thank you to Julie Corbett for leading us and representing us on the uh, School Counseling Redesign Committee. Thank you. Thanks, for sure. Uh, let's see. A um, number of you know that I spent the past week up at a residency for composers in Vermont, and it was really lovely. And I spent a lot of that time thinking about ways to manifest harmony uh, in my home community. Mm -hmm. So that's my announcement about that. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Meek, for that. Um, unfortunately, I will be in Florida next week, so I will miss the first meeting. Um, but once I am back, I look forward to um, seeing that committee come to, to um, start working and, and um, the results of it. Um, so 
There was an incident that happened last week in Danbury, and it's been on my mind quite a bit over the last um, few days. And a high school student passed away in an apparent suicide. Um, and possible bullying and postings on social media are being investigated in the role that they, that may have played in her death. And I, I first of all want to express my condolences to the family and friends of that student and the entire Danbury community as they go through this. Um, personally, I've unfortunately had more experience with both bullying and mental health than I would like for anyone to experience. Um, and I know there are people that have experienced much, much more with both of those areas than myself as well. And I think while the investigation is still underway, it's so important that every student in our schools, and this coincides nicely with the, the new task force for the, um, the counseling work, because it is so important that every single student in our Norwalk schools has at least one adult that they can contact to and reach out to about any issue that's happening in their personal or their um, academic lives. And this is something several of our schools are already working on. Um, but it needs to be the norm for every single Norwalk student. Um, and and I, I hope that continues. Um, in addition, I think we also talk a lot about bullying in our schools. And I wonder what example we as adults set for our kids. And I see it nationally, and I see it locally since moving to Norwalk four or five years ago. And I just wanted to say our words and actions have consequences. And some of those are felt short term, and others are long term. But they have meaning, words and actions have meaning, and can harm others in ways that are difficult and sometimes impossible to repair from. And so, you know, while I, I look at this not only as my role as a parent, um, and even when I say things to my two and a half year old uh, that maybe I shouldn't, um, or when he repeats me with words that I realize I really shouldn't have said, um, we, we really must teach our children compassion and respect, but even more importantly, we must demonstrate it ourselves. Um, we are the example for our children, and I just hope that our Norwalk community, um, as well as nationally, that, that we really can um, start to address that more as adults for our kids. For sure. <clears throat> Madam Chair, can I um, just do one thing before you approve the minutes? I guess so. so on your, um, on your um, agenda tonight was the approval of our new Director of Labor Relations, and um, I, over, I overlooked uh, the introduction. <laughs> Following that, I'd like to ask um, Javier Padilla if he would come up uh, with Mr. Sugar and uh, just introduce him, please. Good evening. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce um, Attorney Christopher Sugar. Um, he will be joining us as the Director of Labor Relations. Uh, he graduated from undergrad from the State University of New York with a degree in English and Philosophy and obtained his law degree from Western New England uh, College in Springfield, Massachusetts. He's a member of the um, Bar Association. He has spent his um, career in private practice, um, most recently with Birch and Moses in Milford. Um, and he brings expertise in labor law, arbitration, mediation, collective bargaining, and many of his clients have been uh, municipalities, boards of ed, and uh, a housing authority. So very well versed in the field um, and in our industry, and so he's gonna be able to hit the ground relatively quick. So I'd like to uh, say thank you to the board for taking the decision to hire me, and I look forward to working with Javier and the superintendent and with the board and the Norwalk community and uh, making so we can have a very collaborative and uh, enjoyment, enjoyable uh, work experience. So thank you and uh, have a good evening. Welcome. Thanks. Welcome. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Now thank we you. will move on, of course. Now we will move <coughs> on to the approval of minutes. And I know Ms. Mayor Mitchell caught a couple of things, which is good. Uh, hang on one second, so let me pull up my notes. So are we on January 1st? Yeah, let's January do it in order. Okay, so it's Miss Meyer Mitchell suggested moving capital costs for furniture on page eight and instruments on page five to the capital budget from the operating budget so that the cost can be amortized over several years and reduce the impact on the operating budget. That was left out of the minutes. 
Um, I, that's a good question. Or what topic? Uh, it was as we were discussing the budget, which was essentially the entire, mm -hmm. uh, I think it should go somewhere near Ms. Corbett, Ms. Carsmith stated that goal number two was band instruments. It was a little bit subsequent to that. It was that we were talking about the Montessori furniture and the band instruments, and it was about three hundred thousand. Starts on two hundred seven. Starts on two hundred seven. Sorry, guys. At a two twenty nine. Yeah. <laughs> two well, it's the, it's hey, a little late reading at bedtime. The curriculum guy. Yeah. Okay. You got anything else? Yeah, I do. Oh, just that's it on that. Should we for the vote the on the eighth? Seven minutes. Yeah. Um, minutes. Yeah, I had one on page. Where did I write it down? Uh, I believe page four, Mr. Lyon's name is missing an S. Oh, good catch. But that could really be used against him someday. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the 200s here, you're saying 207 districts. But that's all I had for the eighth. Okay. okay. So uh, does anybody else have anything for the, no? Okay. All well, motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. All in favor? Okay. Let's move on to B, the January 15th, which I am still unable to find in this massive page. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not telling me what page it is. I apologize, Jill. Uh, it's on page 213. Okay. Does anyone have any corrections? Yeah, I was left off of the attendance okay. on that, dear. Do we mark when someone has left early in the no. minutes? No, we do not. Okay. Yes. Okay. Usually so it's in within the me within minutes. The Okay, did, was Eric, I know Eric left that meeting early. Did you mark it within the minutes? 213. Okay, great. If you could, that would be great. Then on page five of that, um, could you amend it to say, Ms. Meyer Mitchell inquired whether the statistics regarding individual education evaluations reflected an increase in the number of families who were unhappy with the in-house evaluations they received? And on page seven, um, I apologize, I'm trying to. It's a more annoying than you would imagine to skim through this. <laughs> I apologize. Um, Ms. Meyer, Ms. Meyer uh, asked for an overview of all asbestos issues uh, and projects that needed to be addressed district-wide. And then the, um, it says during the year so the committee could review. I'd just like to amend that to the facilities committee, please. Yep, that's it. Anybody else? Okay. Motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Okay, all in favor? Um, on page five, skim, skim, skim. It really is not as convenient as one would think. Um, I'd like to amend. Oh, never mind. This is yes. Okay. <laughs> that I noted where it says Miss Meyer thanked the committee for its hard work and asked if there was enough. What I actually was saying that I noted in the video examples in the presentation, there were additional positions, especially as school climate director, and I, et cetera. Is that all? Yep. Okay. And um, in the future, but it doesn't have to be amended in all these minutes now, I, I capitalized the M in my name. So and it's L-E capital M-I-E-U-X. And I have a hyphen Jennifer. in mine. Okay. All in favor of improving those minutes as amended. I am abstaining okay. from lack of attendance. Gotcha. Okay. Now that we have approved those, which... Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Second. Second. All in favor. Wait. Second. Question. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? Yeah, I didn't hear the last vote on the last Oh, vote. It, was, it was four yeses and I abstained. Oh, but I didn't hear the last thing. I was making... 